<laughs> uh, so this evening, we want to continue with our third of four uh, book discussions that are occurring in our summer quarter, which is July, August, and September. And uh, for our third book of the uh, of the four, uh, we are pleased to have a great book and a great moderator <laughs> in, in the way of Matt Albertson. And Matt is going to be presenting uh, a, a discussion here, uh, moderating a discussion having to do with level playing fields. A book written by Peter Morris. Oh, back in uh, I have a copy here. Um, Oh, let's see, how many years ago was that now? Well, uh, 2000 and, um, no, 2007. Okay, so uh, this is the book, and it is a, um, it's another gem. I can't get mm -hmm. over the, uh, the books that are coming up here uh, for discussion. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, uh, so without further ado, I want to uh, welcome Matt and uh, welcome you all to the uh, the book club discussion. Bob, did you have any? Uh, uh, we can un you can either mute yourself and just raise your hand. Uh, it's you can use the chat button, but uh, you may not need it in this uh, in this kind of scenario. Yeah, in the first two sessions, we haven't. Uh, we've been able to mm -hmm. just, the conversation has not fallen on top of each other, and we've been able to just keep it going. Just let Matt recognize you or just chime in if that if that doesn't happen quick enough for your, your satisfaction, and then you could write him a, a, a terrible note later. <laughs> I want to add one thing. I want to add one thing. Matt gave this presentation at the Fred in uh, April, and I attended it. And I, I begged him <laughs> to, come, to come and do it uh, for the night nice, uh, as a book discussion because, it, well, not uh, I begged him to do something else on the 19th Century Speaker Series, but uh, but I knew that this book when I, when I when he proposed this book, I knew this would be interesting. Okay, take it away, Matt. All right, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thank the uh, 15 other uh, others of you uh, who found 19th century groundskeeping such a topic that you wanted to join together and discuss it on a Thursday evening. So uh, first I'll introduce Peter Morris, um, who really doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but uh, in case anybody joins along later uh, via YouTube in the future, uh, you might enjoy this. So Peter Morris was born in Birmingham, England and grew up in Toronto, Canada. He graduated from the University of Toronto with a degree in English and later from Michigan State University with a master's degree in English. Uh, he was also the 1989 World Scrabble Champion. Wow. So put that on your bingo card. Wow. <laughs> Morris joined Sabre in the mid 80s and became fascinated with the history of the early baseball and how baseball evolved from a primitive game to what it is today. His research on Mich Michigan baseball between 1840 and 1875 led to his first book, Baseball Fever, Early Baseball in Michigan, which won the 2004 Seymour Medal for the best book on baseball history. Next, Morris researched and wrote the two-volume work, A Game of Inches, the story behind the innovations that shape baseball. This encyclopedia answers virtually any question a person would have about the development of the game. This groundbreaking book was the winner of both the Seymour Medal and the Casey Award in 2006. In 2007, Level Playing Fields, How the Groundskeeping Murphy Brothers Shaped Baseball was published. The following year, Morris published But Didn't We Have Fun, an informal history of baseball's pioneer era between 1843 and 1870. He capped off the decade of the 21st, uh, the first decade of the 21st century with an in-depth look at the catcher's position in his 2009 monograph, Catcher, How the Man Behind the Plate Became an American Folk Hero. In 2010, he was one of nine people who were awarded Sabre's inaugural Henry Chadwick Award, which honors, quote, those researchers, historians, analysts, and statisticians who work, whose work has contributed most to our understanding of the game and its history. And then his latest book, Cracking Baseball's Cold Cases, Filling in the Facts About 17 Mystery Major Leaguers, was published in 2013. 
Not a bad decade for Peter Morris. So with all of that, uh, we begin with the introduction. Um, and he mentions in the introduction that the action of baseball is shaped by its playing fields in ways that would be unthinkable in other major team sports. The struggle to forge the earliest ball fields was thus a metaphor for pioneers mm -hmm. who had trekked west in the first half of the century. Yet, paradoxically, as we shall see, the building and maintenance of baseball diamonds eventually came to symbolize a very different strain of, main, uh, of the American experience, the establishment of permanent settlements. So something that we find early on in the book is Peter takes a 30,000 foot view of of a topic. We're not necessarily diving right into groundskeeping in the 19th century. We're talking about dirt and the playing field and and how culture is intertwined with this whole thing that he's eventually going to talk to us about, which is the Murphy brothers and the evolution of groundskeeping. Does anybody have any comments about what they thought about this introduction before we jump into a few questions? Feel free to jump in. I learned a lot about Peter Morris. I didn't know, and that was I'm I'm glad to have that. Good, yeah, Peter. I, I just I just want to add one thing that uh, and that was excellent because uh, you really ran through, uh, you know, that his that analog uh, analog of everything he did. But I want to mm -hmm. also mention that he was among at the very first Fred conference that we did uh, when Frederick Ivor Campbell actually ran the panel discussion. Peter was one of the panelists, and that panel discussion had to do with uh, research, researching, writing, and publishing. Uh, and it was an excellent panel, and Peter was a member of that. He was already at, <laughs> on our radar. And, and that Game of Inches was later published in one volume, as I recall, too. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Peter was also the kind of the driving force in baseball pioneers and baseball founders. Oh yeah, that, that yeah, the committee those. that the committee put together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got that set. So I think. Go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. I was saying I think what was really fascinating to me <laughs> is to read that introduction and think about baseball in the in the terms of manifest destiny in the same mm -hmm. vein. It's just I never really thought about, you know, the, the he talks about the whole, you know, drive west and the and the, the land. And he not only talks about the land, but he talks about the for lack of a better word, the land, like how much it influenced it into the good land. And then obviously we talk learn later in the book about some of the really bad land that we have. But I thought that was a really neat tie into the whole man land, manifest destiny, and baseball. That was really cool for me. I think it's really necessary that he starts with this 30,000 foot view because it's the first part that really divorces us from the modern time. Um, when you think about groundskeeping today, it doesn't come up very often. Um, occasionally a journalist will do something about the local groundskeepers and the unique things that they do today, but he's talking more about um, what the land is, as you mentioned, Paul, manifest destiny and, and how this spirit and how this culture is developed and why groundskeeping begins um so why is it why is the marvel of groundskeeping no longer a marvel to us like we're when we think about modern groundskeeping and what he's introducing here what why is it no longer marvel why aren't we reading much about these guys I, I would venture that some of it has to do with the uniformity of it all, in that like even though ballparks are quite unique, like the actual playing field outside of like the foul territory is almost exactly the same in every park. You know, like there's not too much difference. And by standardizing it, you you know, you have all these people who are now professionals who enter into it as a career. And so it just becomes a thing that you can do and it's a skill set you can learn and you can go to school for it. I'm sure there's groundskeeping schools, all sorts of stuff. And so once it's standardized, once it's professionalized, it sort of takes on a different kind of element. And then it's the kind of thing like you never want to notice an umpire. If you notice an umpire, usually because he's doing something bad. And if you notice a groundskeeper, it's because 
they fell under the tarp when they're running and doing that or because something went wrong in the field, right? Like that's what you would notice. So when the whole point of these like good groundskeeping is that it's unobtrusive and that you actually take it for granted, you know, and like that's kind of the sign of a, a good person who does this, a good team that does this is, you know, it's unobtrusive. And so when you, your whole job is to be unobtrusive, then you yourself become unobtrusive, I think, and, and sort of in the background. I also I think, think artificial turf had something to do with that. For a while, yeah. most stadiums were artificial turf. And what's mm -hmm. a groundskeeper going to do on an artificial field except, you know, vacuum it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was going to piggyback a little bit on what Justin said. And uh, my thought was, you know, what we see now is a grounds crew. It's a group of individuals that are pretty much nameless. And, you know, if the tarp fails, then we have a problem. But other than that, they just do their job. We don't think much of them. And there's, there's a multitude. And, and what's neat about this book is it's the Murphy brothers and it's individuals. So we have the individual versus the crew. We have the one versus the many. And it really stood out to me. And I mean, even in the, in the middle part of the book, and I'll be honest, I didn't totally finish the book, but you know, we have the point where they gave, they gave the Murphy brother a house. He had a house on the field. It's his field, his house. You know, you had that individual individuality, and even the individuality of the field versus the crew, which is like, like Justin was saying, the more standardized, for lack of a better word. Also, I was, I was amazed in the, in the book. Well, you know, of course, there's a big issue with drainage, but how the, the Murphy brothers just knew their way around the block when it came to drainage. And they would, far, and Murphy would go from park to park, you know, went to Pittsburgh, I guess it was, and other parks. And I know that's even happened at the turn in, in the early 20th century. I read about groundskeepers who would just go to, to competitors and other teams, uh, other uh, uh, parks, and just show them how to do it right. They mastered how to do it with the right soil, and they would go to other parks and help them build their fields too. And Maybe that's another reason why we don't talk about it. We don't hear about it much that they've, they've grown to master what it takes in their own specific fields. But I, I had a slightly different feel about it. When I read it, it was like, we know something about the Murphy brothers and I think maybe one or two other sets of groundkeepers through this book. But before this book was written, seems to me the groundskeepers were as unknown then as they are now. Uh, I, I think he brought to light the fact that these guys made a big difference in the foundations of baseball, um, which at least I, for one, never would have dreamed of uh, when I was thinking about it. I, didn't, I, I never put it in the context of these guys made errors because their fields were bad. I mean, yes, there were occasional references to that, um, but uh, this really brought it home that, you know, a lot of the problems in 19th century baseball stemmed from the inadequacy of the fields, with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. And the whole title of the book, my God, is just a metaphor for the whole game itself, you know, and uh, you know, that, that's what just absolutely blew me away when I, that, when I picked that up. You know, what a perfect title. Right. So... Can we expand a little bit on what the relationship is between American identity and baseball fields themselves? And and this is talked about in the introduction, later in the introduction, um, and it's focused primarily on the middle part of the 19th century. So why are baseball fields placed where they're at? Um, and what issues do those baseball fields have? And why is groundkeeping ultimately necessary for those fields? Ooh. So if we're thinking about the city, is the baseball field being planted in the middle of the city? No, it's being pushed out. Um, well, well land was cheap. Base. The further out you go, the land is cheaper. Cheaper, yeah. Right. So therefore, the, the owners like that idea. They also were looking for something that was on a, a trolley line so they could have something happen and get fans there. But you also had all of this problem with uh, uneven fields that they had to bring in tons of dirt or they had to uh, take tons out to level it off. 
and then you had drainage problems. I remember in the 50s, the uh, sports writers talking about Sportsman's Park being in St. Louis being awful uh, mm. in the infield. There's still lots of pebbles, lots of rocks, that's that sort of thing. Uh, we saw it in, in 1960 when Kubek got got hit in the World Series with the the, the bad hop in his throat. That happened two or three times in the World Series in the 20s or so. But they did, just didn't seem to care. The owners didn't seem to care. As long as the field could be used, they were happy. Uh, Peter, you mentioned uh, being out because uh, the land was cheap. But uh, also, I think this was mentioned in the book, they had the whole thing about public lands, too. You couldn't be, build a field on public lands. And I know the Chicago White Stockings had to leave in 1884 because all that their first their field back then was on, on public mm -hmm. lands. And they had picked it because a trolley, a trolley system was nearby. So they had to go move over to the west side. And I think public lands is mentioned in the book here, too. Yeah. But even before, you know, professional baseball and ownership, they were – where would you play? The city was growing up in the city, so a lot of the clubs maybe were originally playing in a plot of land that wasn't taken in the city. He writes about in the book, and they had to move out outside of the city, and that's a lot of because the land was being taken and people were pushing out west more during that time. The appeal of owning your own land and so on uh, was still there, and that was... Mm -hmm becoming more difficult on the East Coast or the Eastern states in the uh, mid 19th century. So you have this this push out West, you know, eventually in the 1890 when they say, you know, the, there is no more West, there is no more frontier. But, um, you know, that's that's what struck me is is uh, even pre ownership was, you know, where can we find the land to play this game that we want to play? I, I'm trying, yeah. trying to remember what wasn't most of the land leased. Oh, the club didn't own it. They they owned the grandstand because they would buy the the wood and, and and do the construction. But there was an awful lot of times when when they get tossed out because a road came through in New York or something of that nature, and they sold the the, the planks from the bleachers, and that's how they broke even and went to find another lease. Going off the were... point. Um, the end of the last paragraph, the subject sentence is, the urban landscapes expanded relentlessly, the incongruity of expansive green baseball fields in their midst evoked nostalgia for the days when the American frontier seemed limitless and settlers could always dream that greener pastures lay ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we're getting into the spiritual about American identity, about <laughs> nostalgia, even in the 19th centuries, for the good old days, as they say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Speak, speaking of the good old days, I guess there's another weird take here. I thought about it from the standpoint of a kid growing up in the, in the inner city. And if he wasn't on the Little League teams, he had to go find, with his friends, a, you know, a parking lot, a, a lot of some kind to play ball in. And so we didn't have owners to contend with, but we had the same kind of problem. The players wanted to play. Uh, the, maybe they weren't going to be big league players, but they had to find a spot to play. And a lot of the spots we found to play were pretty miserable. Uh, but we did. And I think that was a lot of the, the current of this book was about those early baseball players. Yeah, the owners didn't get them the fields they wanted, but they wanted to play ball. So they played. You hit on the next point that I wanted to go into. So what a great segue. Sorry. <laughs> problem. Not a problem. It's a great segue. And, and really all I have are questions for us to expand on. So um, we'll go from there. So how did the history and experience of the Irish impact the Murphy, Murphy brothers' careers as groundskeepers? So what, necess what factors necessitated groundskeeping and dedicated groundskeepers? And what's the, what do the Irish have to do with that? What makes them uh, more often than not able to be a groundskeeper? We're talking about dirt under the fingernails. We're talking about blue collar work style. We're talking well, about working with your hands. Well, the Irish, even into the, the 20th century, were primarily a farming culture. Yep. 
uh, mm -hmm. and they and they came from that. It was difficult if you're in Boston or New York to to have much farming uh, uh, going on, but they still taught one another and carry that with their experience with them. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're, you know, obviously here being in Buffalo, they, they dug the Erie Canal. They had that dirt under their fingernails. And that was really, he talked about that quite a bit. And I also think that honestly, you know, they had that, they, he talked about the Irish need not apply. Irish need not apply. And, you know, these are jobs that are, you know, they're, they're the, the dirt of the earth and they're, those are the ones that they're going to gravitate to. And those are the ones that they're going to excel at. And I think that they were also, they were taking them no matter what was there, they would take it too. So I wonder if it's kind of a chicken before the egg where did the Irish need the groundskeeping? Were they good at it or did they need the Irish, you know, because they, nobody else would do it. Interesting paradox. What's everybody think about that? Well, I, I think he sort of talks in the book that that because of, you know, the push-pull factors and sort of the difficulties of Gordon Island after the famine and all that sort of stuff, and then the conditions that you live in where you're often living kind of either in squalor or in really crowded conditions, it made them very well situated to move to these urban centers and live in tenements and just all these sorts of things that became very conditioned to just, like, whatever whatever the Irish cultural factors were, it made them well situated to adapt to the Industrial Revolution in, in, in the States and as these cities grow and expand and jobs need to be done, it's like, well, the Irish will do it because yeah, again, like there's limited opportunities, um, but also maybe this predis predisposition or whatever um, you want to say about it, that these skills that they brought over or ways of being that they brought away from the old country so to speak to america like that probably made them well suited to do some of these like very difficult tasks but also excel at them because again there's not a lot of other paths to success uh, in america at that point in time it could also, it also have something to do with the fact that a lot of the players were irish and hey i want to hang out with my buddies <laughs> but i can't play ball to save my ass so maybe i can oh yeah That's dig in the dirt and still hang out with my buddies I also thought it was significant that they were outside a lot. I mean, it gave them the ability to be out uh, mm -hmm. for most of the year doing one thing or another with the land. So I thought that was a, a factor also. Hmm. Peter, you're on mute. Peter, you're muted. Jerry Casway's excellent biography of uh, Adela Hanty is subtitled uh, a Baseball's Emerald Age, you know, mm. and it truly was. When the groundskeepers came along, it was Baseball's Emerald Age. And I think there was a great comfort level, uh, as, as Rock just pointed out here, that, you know, well, you know, the groundskeepers, among other, a lot of Irish players on the field, a lot. And if you look at the managers that are beginning to rise, uh, in this era uh, and the early 20th century, they are Irish, a lot of them. So, um, it, you know, I think there was a, a certain amount of trust, or, you know, um, give and take between them. And using using Jerry's uh, uh, Ed Delahanty book, um, he talks about why were the Irish so good because they played so hard. They had this disposition that life was hard and they put that out on the field. Um, in a similar way, because the Irish worked a lot of manual labor jobs in the 19th century, um, groundskeeping became sort of a natural avenue for a job. Um, and going back to Frederick Jackson Turner, we're taming the land, <laughs> taming this baseball field, that's out of nothing and we're making it as as pristine or as advantageous as possible right so my next question is how did urban sprawl impact the location of ball fields and what factors negatively impacted play if anybody's ever played vintage baseball and has played on an awful field 
you understand what these guys are talking about in the 1860s and 1870s. Despite what the newspaper accounts might have said, not every ball field was as flat as a billiard table. Yeah, I, I encountered this a lot in the my Union Association book, and you'd find every single team, like the puck would be talked about with lavish, like it's the best puck. Like the Baltimore Union's like, like it's like the it's a oval, it's a monument to whatever. And then like the season they tried moving to a different poke and then they find that poke so much worse that they have to go back to the old poke. And yeah, you know, so it's like, yeah, there's a lot of flowery language given, but also just like the idea that um, because land is, these cities are rapidly expanding, populations growing, land becomes a premium. Yeah, we're, we can't really afford to put a ball field in the middle of somewhere, you know, like it's it's very costly to invest in that. And so, yeah, you often have with ball fields further out and then because so many of these cities were developed built along rivers and ports and all that sort of stuff you have like pittsburgh where the exhibition grounds are just seem like awful like in terms of drainage all that sort of stuff but it's that's where the land is that you can do it's accessible to the rest of the city but also you have to just contend with the nature so it seems like you take land where you can get it and because cities were by water most of the time then you know, the water also becomes like flooding, becomes a real central thing for almost all of these like ball fields. So I think it was just, yeah, you, you found that, you found a pug where you could get it. And I think the New York illustration was interesting because I hadn't realized how difficult it was to find actually a spot to play in New York City, in Brooklyn. Um, and yeah, so the idea that like for 10 years, the Yankees and the, the Giants are sharing the polo grounds while well, they're trying to figure out what to do. I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't really considered that that the issue was actually finding viable land to build a stadium on in New York City. And that's that's the whole problem, you know. So and yeah. Land is the absolute most important thing, but it's impossible to find in, in these growing open centers. So yeah. You hit the <laughs> nail on the head. Um and as an anecdote regarding Exposition Park in Pittsburgh, um, when was the last time anybody's been to a baseball field? next to a river and really had to think about, you know, how many mosquitoes am I going to get bit by today? <laughs> oh, because yeah. of the standing pools of water in center field. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think we can, you know, jump ahead a little bit and, you know, going off of what Justin said about some of the factors that, that uh, impacted where ball fields were, we find out with John Murphy, Tom's brother, that um, the issue in New York, putting an American League team in New York City was hard, right? Um, and then we have to deal with moving the polo grounds due to New York City politics. So one place they have to use dynamite to create a ballpark. Another place they have to yeah. <laughs> wait for the political machine to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well one thing about selecting spots um about i think it was the hospital for infectious diseases closed in philadelphia and that freed up the land for uh shive and mac to build what ultimately become you know county mac stadium and then the neighborhood quickly grew up around it and you know all that led all that led to so you know i guess it was a at, at the early 1900s it was an undesirable area because of the hospital and they took advantage of that and is, isn't that the same situation in boston what fenway is is a swamp because yeah. they, the, the fens was where the swamp overflowed yeah. the, the river yeah also um also they still have problems at fenway park uh, with uh, downpours that sometimes flood into the dugouts. And they have worked for decades on a system in order to keep the field reasonably dry. I mean, probably underneath it, there's a, just a total like network of drainage ditches that are all underneath it. I know that it wasn't too many years ago that they ripped up the entire field and redid it. And when you look at the old maps of 1912, it's a wasteland out there. And now look at it today. <laughs> it's just, it's all built up around. The buildings are all towering over Fenway Park and kind of dwarfing it in the neighborhood. 
Uh, and it was the same reason. They planted it out there because the land was cheap. It was swampy. Fenway, yes, there's a river not too far away from it. Um, you know, the Muddy River and the Charles over on the other side. So uh, that's really kind of the um, a great example on a lot of the ball fields around that started out like that, especially the ones that have stayed around, uh, the older ones. Um, and Fenway is probably going to stay there for a lot longer. Uh, on the question of, of drainage, didn't the Murphy start to deal with that a little bit? It started with just putting a crown on the field, but right. didn't they on the edge. put drains in in, in the yeah. 90s? Yeah. And the different types of soil, I think, too, they use. And, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I vaguely recall beating that. One of right. the stories that they used was um john murphy rowing out to center field in the polo grounds and pulling up the caps on the drain so the field would drain yeah right I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about that as state-of-the-art technology and groundskeeping well, well the, uh, 1951 the, world series it was in, in right in right field mantle hit one of those drains and and twisted his knee Ooh. gosh yeah, right. think of that. yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah we I, made, we another made, Another, hit the ball. <laughs> oh, yeah. another thing that they had mentioned in 1912 at Fenway Park, there were a couple of things where they had just a bit of a curve along the third base line where uh, call uh, what you could call a foul ball because it would the ball would just gently roll over into foul territory. But also there was um, the uh, a bit of a uh, scandal uh, that uh, somebody tried to get conjuring up, which had to do with the um, uh, the path between uh, second and third, that it was said that the groundskeeper made the sand along there softer so that it would be harder to run along there, but that the Boston players knew to stay a little bit to the left of it. They knew where <laughs> to run and when the opposing teams uh, were unaware of that, and that that was in the Boston American, and I don't know that it was ever you know, ever gone on, but it, I mean, this book totally reminded me of that. I mean, the way the way that he explained it all, and also what I like about all of Peter Mars's books is that he not only brings in about the baseball and the field and everything, but he feeds in a lot of the history that was going on around at the same time. Mm -hmm. It, it fills out the picture of what's going on, you know, about, you know, Irish history and all sorts of things that uh, that uh, contributed to the story. So I, I think that was really you know, one of his greatest skills that he has. I wanted to mention that there's this guy named uh, Roger Bassard. I think his name is he's a third generation groundskeeper and they've all gone from park to park, you know, helping teams. Uh, with their parks. The first one started in 1936, and the current one, they call him the Sod Father, which I think is a neat name. Yeah. So Joanne hit on a couple of cool points um, regarding Fenway Park that can actually go back to Tom Murphy's days as groundskeeper with the Orioles at Union Park. And um, so we find out that Tom Murphy gets a major league gig with the Orioles, and uh, he really tailored Union Park and the yeah. field to mm -hmm. the Orioles' talents yes. and also created a couple of byproducts that the Orioles took advantage of. So we're talking about, you know what, I'll let you all talk about it. What, what, what are some of these aspects that Tom Murphy implemented in his groundskeeping techniques at Union Park in Baltimore? Well, I'm going to throw one out. Go ahead. Jack, I was going to say the grass. Oh, thank you. The grass was thicker at one part, so the the way the ball would roll, oh. uh, and I think one time he said that the the catcher could barely see the uh, top of the right, the head of the right fielder. Was that at that park? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, then. Yeah. No, no, no. I was just going to say, and and Joanne knows me a little bit about this, but I am a huge <laughs> fan of Jimmy Collins because Jimmy Collins is buried here in Western New York, and what's fascinating to not nah, Joanne's not in her head. What's fascinating to me about that is Jimmy was actually, so you have the Baltimore chop, you have what he talked about yeah. in the book and Baltimore Jimmy chop. was one in theory, one of the first third baseman to play in on that grass in on that at the hot corner. 
in to combat that. And it's kind of really, I, I just kept reading it and I reread it a couple of times because to me it was like getting goosebumps because it was like <laughs> the Murphy brothers, because of what they did, may have created the Jimmy Collins and that first third baseman in the Hall of Fame. That just blew my oh, mind. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I don't know if you want to run that with that for a moment, Joanne. I, I'll give, you know, he's, he's like a, the only, you know, Boston hero I have. I, oh. You're not going to get that out of David Ortiz for me, but you'll get it out of Jimmy for me. So. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, um, every time I go to Fenway Park, I go and pay homage to his picture, which is over near where the, um, a couple of the concessions are, but I always go over there because he, he was one heck of a good looking guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, last time I went to the hall before I came to the Saber convention, I took my buddy the first time and I said, we're going to meet a hall of famer before we go to the hall. And I took him to Jimmy's grave. So, yeah, um, oh, yeah. yeah I, I, I'm a huge Collins guy. So anyway, yeah. I just well, thought you, I would throw you, that out real quick. Do you What's know that? the song, the song that the uh, drop? Of course, Murphy. of course yeah, I know the song. <laughs> I have a drop kick Murphy <laughs> sticker in the back of my car. Of course I know the, of course I know the song. There's about this much I like about Boston. Okay. But you'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. I'm sorry. Let me hand it back over to you, Matt or Joanne. I'm so sorry about that little segue. So, mm-hmm. Matt, uh, Matt, I had heard. Didn't Murphy's kind of talk, depending on the t- visiting team that was coming in, they would tailor the 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 foul lines on the infield so it would either roll the bunt would go foul or fair if right. the yeah. Orioles yeah. were better bunters. Well, even later on, too, real quick, um, there was a quote in there from um, um, Christy Matthewson about how they changed the mound, too, which was really fascinating to me, how he would raise it or lower it, depending if Christy Matthewson played. So, (laughs) Yeah, they started to (laughs) fine-tune, really fine-tune at that time, you know. I just uh, just wanted to bring up just something that Matt talked about a moment ago. about you know thinking about fields you played on as a kid and and the problems of you know those fields when uh, you know every there was stones or whatever was on the field no grass at all and uh it got me thinking about uh, a 19th century great shortstop jack glasscock and jack uh i think is one of our overlooked legends from a few years ago and he was one of the best defensive shortstops in the uh, in the 19th century. But what was his nickname? Pebbly Jack. Pebbly Jack. Yeah. Pebbly Jack. Yeah. Because he spent his entire time when it wasn't fielding, picking up pebbles. <laughs> throw them up. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think in the book. Uh, that mentions the hill at Houston and how the Houston players got to really, really know how to run out there in the outfield. But of course, the opposing players, they would uh, frequently bobble balls. Speaking of picking up dirt, at Union Park, if you're an opposing pitcher, you could pick up the wrong kind of dirt that might be mm, cleaner than the rest of the dirt, so to speak. Putting soap in dirt. Oh, yeah, the soap. Harder to grab the ball. Yeah. Same so, thing in the batter's box, right? They do the same thing. For that. Does anybody recall, and I'm going to look through it now, um, was anybody shocked at the Orioles' home winning percentage as yeah, compared to, crazy, yeah. you know, they were good regardless, but their home winning percentage was hilariously high. Yeah. It was what, in the 600s or 700s? <laughs> they said for the decade, like it was 600, like like in the National League in the 1890s, like, like and then since then it's like stabilized but that 1890s it went crazy because of all this malfeasance in the <laughs> in each poke i guess you know sleight of hand just yeah, sleight sleight of hand. Hand. yeah 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 <laughs> well they were doing they were doing a number of things because you had hanlon and mcgraw yeah. playing with with uh, defenses and offenses and heckling and and tripping or grabbing belt loops or whatever it may be and they would also meet with the groundskeeper and say make the ball go this way right yeah. here it is between yeah. 1894 and 1898 the orioles boasted an excellent 188 and 141 one loss record for a 571 percentage on the road um 
but at home they were virtually unbeatable with a 264 and 73 record which represents uh a 783 percentage i mean that's just extraordinary <laughs> talk about totally total home field advantage yeah, uh, yeah. The stuff that tom murphy put into play and and like we mentioned earlier the baltimore chop which is a name that's still thrown around by broadcasters occasionally is that was a byproduct of of murphy making the field incredibly hard and they found that if they chopped at the ball it would just stay up there the ball would just bound so high and their fast base runners could make it easily to, to first base um creating a totally unique style of baseball and i think he used a quote from john montgomery ward saying whatever it is they're playing in baltimore isn't baseball it's something else i thought that was really good that's such a good line yeah <laughs> so um what i think and i think we really already covered it uh my my next question was what is inside baseball and how did murphy fit in i think we pretty much covered that whole bit um, about you know really creating a home field advantage um, and what elements of the game changed at the time of the 20th century um, and I'll give you the three broad topics level playing fields umpiring and ownership so we talk about a couple different things is anybody able to jump in there well, increasing the number of umpires from one to two was a big deal, obviously. Uh, got somebody to be able to look at what the players were doing on the field. And the National League had flirted with that for several years before finally implementing it, I think yeah. in the 1899 or 1900 season. Yeah. I, th I think Peter Morris talks about uh, eliminating dual ownership, too, which enabled the fans to see the game as, as being fair. I remember reading that, too. Right. Yeah. We do cover yeah, a couple of by the 1890s. There. It was a disaster. Like the the syndicate ownership kind of led to the contraction of the National League, and then obviously created the breeding ground for the American League to come up and stuff. So, yeah, the the ownership once it changes, yeah. then yeah, you 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 convey to the fans that everything's equal, and and these issues are still problematic today because you know i'm a baltimore Orioles fan and you have a best season in a long long time and you have john angelos like talking about how you know we might have to move to nashville and yeah. uh can't sign extensions and we have to you know act like a poverty franchise at the same time that you're like you know so it's these issues still kind of exist in just different forms in 2023 but yeah they must have been much worse and because i've read a lot of andrew friedman anecdotes and he sounds like just maybe the worst guy in baseball history <laughs> be involved in any period of time. Right. And if I can pop this open really quick, um, we talked about popularity of the Orioles. The Orioles were certainly popular at home um, for several years, but not exactly for the entire decade. Um, people got tired of it. Like we find the big league era, or at least some of us might find it, uh, incredibly fascinating because of all these things that come up that make it quirky. Um, and, but at the time people didn't particularly care for the antics. Um, but for example, uh, Baltimore, it doesn't look like Baltimore never led the national league in attendance during the decade of the 1890s, despite being, an outstanding club in the middle part of the decade. They went in 94, 95, and 96, but um, they were never tops in the league in attendance. And it eventually dwindles off despite being, you know, a really good team. And part of that is because of syndicate baseball, which Jack mentioned. Well, uh, okay. Uh, can I ask a question here? Are you ahead. talking about the dual ownership, like with the, the Robuses with the St. Louis and Cleveland? And yeah. that's why they took the best players from the Cleveland moving to St. Louis. Were there any other examples of that uh, besides uh, that Cleveland situ uh, St. Louis situation in the uh, in eighteen in, in the eighteen nineties? Late in the eighteen nineties, Baltimore and Brooklyn had a a com co ownership or oh I, I didn't know that that yeah. sort of thing and and Hamlin moved a whole bunch of those. That's how Bresnahan, I think, and and. Uh, uh, several other above average players ended up in New York 
uh, uh, and and Baltimore started to decline, and that's why Baltimore was one of the four teams that was dropped from the National League in nineteen. Oh, okay. I was in. That was one of my questions. Okay. So you know, Louisville, Louisville, Cleveland, and Washington. I didn't know why Baltimore, but now you just answered it. Right. Oh, and P- Pittsburgh, and Louisville was also syndicate ownership yeah. as well. Like, kind of, I think it's a little bit different, but like Dreyfus bought into Pittsburgh and then moved Florida uh, Swagger. Well, it was all part of one transaction. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, just oh, okay. It was all okay. Good. When, when uh, Dreyfus buys uh, 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 Pittsburgh or buys his, his share, a minority share. Mm-hmm. 49 percent or something like mm. that but uh uh he had a he had paid louisville five thousand dollars for the right to name where assuming the the team went out of business where the players went oh, and, okay and if he did and there was an option five thousand to do that and if he actually did it he would pay them another twenty five thousand mm. and louisville <laughs> needed the money to pay off their debts yeah okay okay well, how, how much how much did Pittsburgh have to pay Louisville to get Honus Wagner? Well, he was part of the trade. Uh, it's ostensibly a trade, but it was certainly Dreyfus controlled the mm. future of all those players. Uh, right. But it turns out they took they took too many from Louisville because Louisville still was looking for the uh, National League to pay them to get out of the league, and they had no players. <laughs> So Jack Combs gets traded to, to Louisville and a couple of other players. So they have signed a couple of minor leaguers and they had nine players and they had, they had ten twelve thousand dollars I think because the mm. ballpark had already burned down. Something to add in is uh, Morris explains that one of the reasons McGraw didn't move to Brooklyn in this syndicate thing was because he had a successful business in Baltimore and didn't want to leave. Uh, <laughs> And Spalding had a hassle with was it Friedman and poor owners. Uh, they want to take over the whole National League, right? Establish yeah. a trust of some sort. Yeah, it Basically, was a huge. Uh, it, was, it was actually a split uh, in 1899. It went down to eight. They they contracted back to eight teams uh, mm. from what was the uh, original Big Twelve, right? The uh, 1892 to 1898. Uh, with the American Association, four teams and the National League's eight teams combining. Mm-hmm. When they went back down to eight league teams, you ended up with four owners who wanted syndicated baseball. Oh yeah, where they yeah. where they where they had interest in you know more than one team, and you had four owners who objected to it, and it of course Spalding uh, <laughs> crowns himself the uh, savior of. Of baseball by uh, uh, his manipulation and you know holding a boat at Old Dock Thirty or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to, get the, uh, mm-hmm. to get the uh, you know system that we had for the twentieth century. Well, it's a good thing Ben Johnson came along and organized the American League. Otherwise, God knows what would have happened. Right, yes. right. <laughs> and you so, know, talking about the quality of fields and, and, and urban environments. Uh, the Metropolitans were founded, uh, you know, made possible uh, baseball in Manhattan for the first time in 1880. So it, they were independent, but they joined the National Association for the purposes of a uh, national agreement, rather, for purposes of being able to play National League teams. So <clears throat> When finally, uh, Day and Mutri, or Day owned, uh, by 1883, he owned the Giants and he owned the American Association Metropolitans. Uh, by 1884, they insisted that they could no longer share uh, the field at 110th Street. Hmm. And the Metropolitans had to go far east, uh, right against the East River, up around a about 104th, 105th Street. And it was terrible. It had been a former city dump, and there was no amount of uh, restoration they could do to it to, to make it playable. And uh, eventually, of course, uh, they sold the, uh, the whole enterprise to uh, Erastus Wyman on Staten Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, who had one of the best looking fields because <laughs> you could see the Statue of Liberty in the New York skyline. Right, right by the ferry. But, <laughs> but 
it flooded terribly. So uh, they had their problems there. So I think. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I think another factor related to ownership was the owners at this time were very wealthy businessmen or looking to make a profit. And I think they realized the importance of having somebody keep their grounds in shape because if games are canceled, they're going to lose some money. Um, I think that was a factor. There's all these guys chasing after uh, the Murphys and, and upping the ante to get them to work for them. I think that was a financial financial factor too. There's a, that's a great point, Terry, and and that leads us to a, a pretty cool discussion point, which is the evolution of the groundskeeper. So we find, you know, in the 19th century, particularly with Tom Murphy. Um, and John Murphy that, you know, they they bounce around quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know, year to year, at least yeah. where Peter Morris can find them in the newspapers. Um, and it isn't until really uh, the latter half of the, the 19th century and in, into the 20th where groundskeepers are held on for more than a year or two. Um, and these owners are finding that, you know what, what you said, Terry, it's we're losing money if the field isn't playable, um, particularly with, with big money dates like Memorial Day, the 4th of July, Labor Day weekend, when you can get a double header in. Um, so we find that, you know, we've got the amateur, so to speak, groundskeeper uh, to the professional groundskeeper who's there for a purpose, who gets a team. Um, you know, an anecdote was, you know, these guys – early on in, in the 19th century have a lot of things to take care of, right? They, they aren't just taking care of the ground that the players are playing on. They're responsible for the stadiums. They're living at the stadiums. George Hubel, the groundskeeper for the Phillies in 1894 is called to task because the stadium burned down. And, mm -hmm. and he was a former teammate in 1871 of Al Reaches who owned the Phillies and he gets fired because of it. So, you know what? Um, we're talking about a lot of money here. Friendships be damned, right? So jumping into the 20th century um, to professional groundskeeping, um, what what factors lead to professional groundskeeping aside from the economic factor? Is there anything there? Mm -hmm. Talking about innovations, perhaps. Owners are finding that innovations are are part of this. What about the pitcher's mound? Well, well, I know they they played with the sod. They played with the sod quite a bit. Different types of grass or different mixtures of grasses, because a lot of times in, in the off season they would rent the park out for football games or, or something mm -hmm. of that nature. Uh, they also needed to have hardy enough grass that they could rent it out when they were on the road to a minor league or a, a Negro league or college team or something of that nature wasn't we there find... something peter made a point peter made a point about them actually becoming like landscape artists as opposed to just yeah. groundskeepers mm -hmm. and that people mm -hmm. in the stands really liked the flowers and the designs and things like that and i guess that was perceived to be part of the attraction and why you would want somebody better than the average so let's dive into that just briefly. I know we're running out of time here, but we're talking about uh, 19th century ballparks being made of wood. Um, they're not permanent, right? They're transient is something that Morris talks about. Um, and now we've come into an era of permanence. So landscape, landscapers. I mean, Murphy's uh, creating ornate, uh, yes. designs mm -hmm. in the field at the polo grounds. He's using flower beds that sometimes the players screw around with and plant, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables in uh, to his behest, right? Um, but these are becoming permanent things. And after the 1890s, where people started to say, I'm not so sure about baseball, now they want to come back and see what the ballpark has to offer. Mm -hmm. It also yeah. mentioned it came over a year round job. I think it was McGraw that sent John Murphy, right? Worked for McGraw down yeah, yeah. ahead to prepare the spring training site. So instead of being mm -hmm. just a seasonal job, he would hire, I want to say, a month ahead of time. So mid February, early March, and send him down to um, uh, Texas, right? 
um, or wherever they were going to have spring training to get the field ready um, prior to the uh, arrival of, of the Giants. Um, so it went from being, I mean, in the 19th century, they talked about just groundskeepers, sometimes just during the homestand was the only time they'd get paid. Um, and then the, the Murphy brothers were more um, getting paid more, you know, right. when the team was away as well. And then John Murphy was being paid more year round and more valued for their work and what they could contribute to the team. Right. And, and we talk about those ballparks to the South, of course, the, uh, the climate's a bit different. They talked about more talks about <laughs> spin ball fields where you couldn't get grass to grow until you bring in a guy like John Murphy, who is an expert in groundskeeping and has been around the block numerous times, <laughs> has seen it all. Uh, sure. Right. With issues at the ballpark. And now he's growing sod and a terrific ballpark down there in Marlin Springs, Texas, where grass would not grow. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> I guess the question is twofold, right? What's the difference between the groundskeeping um, uh, tactics between Tom in the 1890s with Baltimore and John with the New York Giants? and somewhat with the Yankees in the early part of the 20th century, how does groundskeeping change between the 19th century and the 20th century? This goes back to level playing fields. Right. John John tried to bring on the level playing field, the idea that you would go from one field to another and there wouldn't be that many substantial differences favoring the home team. Tom had been the home team, you know, uh, advantage guy. But a his total brother was my kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and and going back to the spring training point that Ian brought up, um, how did how did Murphy change the practice overall of groundskeeping, soup to nuts year round? When we go from spring training, where he starts in December working on the fields, to working on stuff for football season, dealing with uh, goalposts being yanked up out of the field, um, having to set the fields out properly, and having to deal with constant usage of the grounds throughout the summer and throughout the year, as opposed to just during the homestand. I want to ask, that's great. I seem to remember reading an awful lot of times where there were, if there's a lot of rain in the spring, teams would be laying sod to resod the whole field uh, to get ready for the season, and it wouldn't take root because it was just underwater so much. It, is that just an impression I have, or did, was that were they remaking the ballpark's surface to make sure that it did have this quality about it? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's that's hmm. a good question. I don't recall if that's in the book. I know Gene asked a similar question about how players played in the water that was knee deep or ankle deep. <laughs> um, you know what? How how is this? How did they accomplish this? And and how did we get away from it? Well, I think it's an umpire question to some extent. Once the game starts, the umpire's in control. If he says keep playing, you got to keep playing unless you're Charlie Comiskey and you pull your team off the field. <laughs> you know, if, if you look at uh, the home of the original, you know, Yankees Highlanders, uh, Hilltop Park, um, they said that that was one of the hardest surfaces uh, to uh, you know, to negotiate, you know, to to make it playable, it was it was basically I don't know how much dirt they had on top of, you know, bedrock. <laughs> right. And you know, if you're ever in New York City, and you want to get a sense of how rocky Manhattan really was, try to go across Central Park, not on the paths. <laughs> just just try to cross it. <laughs> You start off on grass, and the next thing you know, you're 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 rock climbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if you want to get an idea of what's going on in the 19th century, look at some of the minor league parks that are famous in the 20th century. Uh, Sulphur Dell had that rise uh, out there in right, right field, and a number of parks had ravines and swales and whatnot that they had to play with for, uh, in various various parks. And I picture that's what, if, if you're the Toledo team and you're only going to be there, or Columbus, you're going to be there a couple of years. You hope you're going to be there forever, but you're going to go in on the cheap. Maybe you don't do so much on the on the uh, uh, quality of the field. Because mm-hmm. it's expensive to, <clears throat> to do those sort of things. And you're if you're leasing the land, you got to build a grandstand. Maybe grass is a second thought. <laughs> so I also think like with players always being what they were, you know, I think there was less of a thought like what if the star player gets injured you know on something dumb like because of there's a hill at shortstop or whatever because generally most players aren't star players and the salaries aren't that high that like and the players are much more disposable at that point in time right and so you kind of i think as salaries increase and as superstardom becomes more of a concept there's more incentive to want to eliminate injuries and risk for your players you know uh, so i think that it i don't know that was an explicit thing that was noted but i'm guessing there's some inputs that could push in that direction as well you know as as a result of making playing field level is in part for pro safety as well that that leads me into my final question for the evening um and it's an overarching question you can answer however you like what is the Murphy brothers' legacy, ultimately? I'll that- say, yes. I'll say, uh, a level playing field. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne gets one hundred out of one hundred on the test. <laughs> they, they, plus, they were the, they were that being concise. They they were the evolutionary step from just go find a. a piece of ground and build some uh, bleachers around it uh, to creation of ballparks and stadia as we think of them, maybe not today, but at least by the 20s, if not the teens. For me, I think it's once reading the book, when you go to a ballpark, you never take it for granted anymore. Mm. You look down on that diamond and you begin to have a deeper appreciation of how that came about <laughs> well, well, you, no one's mentioned this but and, and uh, maybe that's not that germane but what really struck me is when one of the murphys would ha- would w- would arrange so the uh players could could be carried or could have uh, be in carriages to the ballpark so they wouldn't get their uniforms all dirty and which had, had never had occurred to me before because you know people would throw rocks at them and they'd certainly be dirty and the sport was viewed as kind of an unkempt and, and below the middle below even the middle class when they started taking them to the ballpark the whole image improved and that was when certainly I, part of their legacy i think i want to oh. just loop back to my thought before about jimmy collins but not only just expand on that but how many players did they influence in the, in their way, either positively or negatively, that may have changed the way that they're in the Hall of Fame? I mean, we talked about Jimmy Collins. You could talk about John McGraw. You could talk about Wee Willie Keeler, all those Baltimore players. You know, would they be in the Hall of Fame? Would these would Jimmy Collins be in the Hall of Fame if maybe he didn't revolutionize that position? I'm just, you know, maybe you could even go as far as that and say, what did their impact on those fields do to those players in, in Cooperstown? And the thing that struck me was, and I don't know if you folks had this experience, but I did when I first went to Fenway, and you read about this a lot, or you hear people talk about this a lot, when they first enter a ballpark, how green it is, and how mm-hmm. the colors stand out, and the ballpark itself is such an experience today. Um, in, you know, green and cathedrals. Said back to the Murphys, that's, yeah. when you're a little kid and you go there, you know, that's part of falling in love with the game, because you just, it's just so aspiring and you know awe-inspiring and and overwhelming that you know like how could something be this green and this beautiful so and And to that point it's almost when uh you know the phillies have a lot of concerts now at citizens bank park when they're away and 
you could tell where the stage was. And it's almost surprising to walk in there and see the indentations of, of the stage or whatever still there because you're so used to be the field being absolutely perfect. I and wonder just yeah. a real quick comment on that to piggyback on what you're saying, Rock. Do you think the, and I mean, I know we're out of time, but could you say the Murphys were the first of not only their kind, but all kinds? So think about, you know, hey, there was a basketball game at the garden and then there's a hockey game or there's a concert and you have like that whole little army of people that change everything around. And they were really maybe the first linchpin that ever started those people that did those things to make the transformation of the of the game, of the, the field. Yeah, you know, that that flip over, whether it's from, like you said, hockey to basketball or basketball to a concert or whatever, is they have it down to a science. You know, every it's like it's chaos, but organized chaos. <laughs> I mean, you look at, for example, Citizens Bank Park, since Rock and I are, are both in the Philly chapter, um, there's a, a building next door to Citizens Bank Park across the street where they grow replacement sod. So if something gets chewed up in the field for a concert or during a baseball game after, you know, a really heavy rain, they rip out that sod, they rip out a piece from the building next door, and they splice it in. <laughs> uh, something else, you know, we talk about is I think some major league fields have um, different species of grass on the infield as opposed to the outfield mm -hmm. and different lengths of the grass depending on what kind of players are playing the infield for the home team and and in the outfield and and so forth and so on and and of course how you manicure the pitcher's mound today too so there still is that <laughs> form of Tom Murphy gamesmanship right while there is the John Murphy level playing field with the ornate bunting and everything that looks just terrific and beautiful from an aesthetic point of view anybody mm -hmm. with any concluding comments or anything to 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 follow that uh, i do i i have one thing i want to say that um uh finish reading level playing fields if you have not but also you know i i have the entire collection of all the peter morris books i i've got every one of them i i mean i could just go on and on and on and on and the whole, <laughs> the whole bit. i got them over here i got them all anyway uh i think it's the best collection of baseball books by one author ever. And every single wow. one is worth reading. And I just want to give That's... him a plug for that. You know, that um, really, if you're looking for really good baseball books, just get a whole Peter Morris collection. You will be totally covered. <laughs> I... And my favorite yeah. one, Cracking Baseball's Cold Cases. A bit of mystery, a bit of history, and a bit of irony. Oh my God, the whole bit, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to say I, I've never met him in person, but we've interacted on, online and he's super nice and super helpful and hugely yeah. influential. When I was thinking about writing my book, I'm like, I asked yes. him, how do you write a book? And he told me. And, <laughs> he's wonderful. So he's, he's, he's incredible. He's just That's yeah, awesome. one, of the, one of the best around. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Matt, thank you very much for the uh, for the evening. Thank you, Matt. It's great. Good time. Yeah, Matt. Matt. Uh, thank you, Matt. Everybody had a chance to, to get their two cents or with inflation, eight cents in, and we're <laughs> ready to go. Uh, let me just, uh, before Peter closes off, uh, September 14th, Thursday, September 14th, is the next session with uh, uh, Dr. Kevin uh, Kreiner, uh, who will be doing uh, uh, a, a sporting time. Uh, New York City and the Rise of Modern Athletics, 1820 to 1870. Uh, a bit of an academic approach to it, but it's very, it opens a lot of historical questions and, and uh, ideas going as the evolution of, uh, of baseball is going on from its town ball to baseball to amateurs to pros to to leagues so it's a very very interesting sort of uh, uh thing to go through uh written by melvin uh edelman uh, uh peter if you'd like to give us a close please yes okay so we all set bob up yes we're good okay as bob mentioned it's september 14th we do have uh, a sporting time 
uh, with Kevin Kariner, and he is going to be uh, discussing that book. What's so what's so interesting is, uh, and that's three weeks from now. And I'm in fact after this meeting, I'm going to be sending out a three week out notice, uh, 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 just as a reminder to our uh, committee members. I want to say that uh, Matt, you did a wonderful job with this. This is really a uh, mm -hmm. yeah a very well led discussion, and uh, really uh, the comments of your comments, but the comments of everybody are, are really uh, you know bring it to life. Uh, I want to say that we're looking forward to the fall uh, quarter, and we already have uh, Jack Bales uh, uh, on the calendar for November and uh, November the 8th, I think it is. That's and, correct. Uh, yes. uh, it'd be another baseball classic, the Beer and Whiskey League. Oh, <laughs> I read that one. That was good. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good Don't one, we start right? the monthly uh, the monthly uh, lectures soon uh, next month? Oh uh, yeah, yes. The uh, uh, second Tuesday in September that is the twelfth. The twelfth of yeah. September, Bill Humber will be opening the uh, yeah. talking about that. some of the uh, formative activities in Canada that uh, might not get quite the. Uh, uh, press and recognition as they contributed to the evolution of baseball in America. Yes. Yeah, an interesting uh, 19th century speaker series, yes. So yeah. anyway, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, Matt for leading this uh, discussion. It was a real, you picked a real good book, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very good. All righty. So we'll see you in about, well, we'll see you at Three the weeks. 19th century speaker Three series weeks. or mm -hmm. uh, beyond at the uh, on the 14th. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank See you, everybody. Thank Have you. a good night, y'all. Yep. Bye. Okay.